In 1938, a group of scientists at Harvard began a longitudinal study of human health and well-being. They recruited 268 sophomores and tracked their physical and mental health and emotional well-being over nearly 80 years. Over the decades, they expanded the original group to include the subject's children and wives and residents of Boston's inner city, ending up with thousands of subjects. They tracked data on those folks' income, achievements, marriages, and community relationships in addition to their health data and their emotional and mental well-being data. And they used that 80 years of comprehensive data from thousands of people to answer the question, what makes for the healthiest, happiest human life? And the number one factor in happiness was, can you guys guess? You're using the subject of the sermon well. Community was Sheila's guess. Other guesses. What is the number one factor? Relationships, relationships, relationships. It was relationships. But not just how many relationships or whether a person was married. It was the quality of a person's relationships that determined their happiness. It was trust in those relationships. Turns out that when you trust someone, when you have a group of people that you can rely on, your nervous system relax, relaxes, your brain stays healthier for longer, and emotional pain is reduced. In contrast, people who feel lonely are more likely to have their health decline and they're more likely to die younger. So it's about relationships, not just how many there are, but the quality of them, whether you can be honest in them, whether you can go to the depths of meaning and be your true, authentic selves. Martin Winecki of the Tamara Peace and Research Education Center in Portugal writes in his book, Unlearning Together, that we are the community beings by nature, that we're grounded through community in the interconnected web of all existence. Sadly, isolation and competition in Western culture trains this inherent instinct out of us in ways that harm our well-being. Isolation causes stress on our psyches and on our bodies. Practicing community is medicine. Winecki wrote, trust is a crucial factor in creating transformative communities as trust is a primordial healing power which reconnects us to ourselves, to each other, and to the world. To develop trust, we need ways of living together in which we dare to drop our masks and freely express what we genuinely think and feel and love. Whenever we can do this fully, we experience liberation and allow others to see us. When truth is allowed, trust emerges. To be seen feels like being loved. We practice community by building relationships of trust here in our congregations. We do it in our theme circles, in our circle supper, suppers, in our pastoral care relationships, our programs for children and youth, our social connections and support, and when we worship together as a full body. Studies have shown that when our bodies move together in common rhythm and purpose, it heals trauma 
and helps rebuild our trust in the world. By singing hymns together, our bodies learn that we are safe and it is okay to trust. In community, we learn that we are part of one another, that your people are my people and my people are your people. In our small groups, and our classes, we create that kind of life-lengthening happiness through depths of relationship that are developed by exploring meaning, by listening to each other's authentic expression of self. Our children and our youth learn things here and have conversations here that they don't have anywhere else in their lives. Our people learn that this community can be relied upon when we show up and care for each other in times of trouble and sorrow. Our pastoral care associates who are trained extensively in listening presence go to homes and hospitals to be with our people when life is hard. And when one of us is dying, your ministers go bringing your love with us and standing there with our folks in that space between life and death, a bridge to the mystery. This kind of community of trust strengthens and emboldens us in our individual lives and out in the world. Not only do relationships of quality, depth, and trust lengthen our lives and make us happy as individuals, as a community of trust, we are also strengthened. In October of 2018, another congregation that had built a community of trust demonstrated how that kind of community makes a difference in strength, courage, and perseverance. As I'm sure you remember, on October 27th of 2018, during Shabbat morning services at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, a white nationalist entered their sanctuary and began shooting, killing 11 members of their congregation and wounding seven in the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in our country's history. The very next day, the leaders of that congregation called M. Dove Kent, who's the former executive director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, to invite M. Dove to come to Pittsburgh and work with Ben the Ark, a progressive Jewish organization, because they wanted to respond to the attack publicly. The next day. And together with Ben the Ark and M. Dove Kemp, they simultaneously worked to take care of their people and help them grieve, to respond to the attack publicly in Pittsburgh and to prepare a powerful national action to rebuke the white nationalist undertones of President Trump when he visited the scene of the crime. That congregation was in crisis. They were in mourning. They were in personal and collective trauma. They mourned lost friends and family members dealing with flashbacks of violence and their escape from it. They were experiencing those awful old chords of historical anti-Semitic trauma strummed by this act of hate. Their holy place, their sanctuary of comfort and safety and trust had been violated in the most horrific way. And yet, the congregation pulled together not only to hold one another, in love, but also to lead people forward away from hate. M. Dove Kent wrote 
the following about her experience of working with them. Immediately, she said, they had the resolve to write a letter to Trump that set fire, that changed the national conversation and unmasked Trump for the white nationalist that he is. For this public bravery and this resolve, we all know there are risks. There was every reason for them to go silent and to retreat, and yet they were completely committed to planning an action, to planning a ritual to heal their community's grief, and then to use whatever energy they had left, and to use the critical moment that they knew they were in to strike a blow against the violent white nationalist movement that killed 11 of their neighbors and friends. What this looked like in concrete terms was that one of the leaders of that congregation led the action wearing the outfit she was wearing the morning of the massacre as she was preparing to go to synagogue that she then changed out of when her friend called her to say, don't go to shul. There is a live shooter there. Through their community of trust, through the strength that they had together as a people with shaking hands and hearts of purpose, that congregation did what was needed. They cared for one another in their grief, and then they led 5,000 people in a beautiful rebuke of Trump's white nationalist undertones. They had the mayor of Pittsburgh and a slew of other elected officials join them to say that Trump was not welcome in Pittsburgh. They caused him to change his plan and end his visit early with no public statements whatsoever, in effect kicking him out of town. This synagogue changed the story. They made things possible that had seemed impossible. Through the power of relationships and strength of trust in community, they exhibit, exhibited courage beyond imaginable bounds and showed the capacity to lead away from hate, even in the face of their own experience of horror. Building relationships and communities of trust makes us stronger, more courageous, and better together. We too create this kind of strength and courage in our own congregation. We walk with our people into the pain of chemo treatments, into the hardness of hospital walls, and the loss of hospice beds. We journey together through the grief of divorce and the trauma of addiction and the loss of our loved ones. And we hold one another's hands in the despair of a world that is shuddering with hate and facing the devastation of climate change. We hold one another's hands and we continue to sing. We build a community of trust together in a world that desperately needs as many of these communities as possible. We pull people out of isolation and we plug them into connection. This matters. This matters here to the people in this room this matters in Milwaukee, and this matters in the world. This is what your stewardship creates. Your pledge isn't just one more cause that you give to. Your pledge creates your place, this place, this congregation, 
and holds a place for your people, your community of practice. You all are the stewards of this congregation, and we all are entrusted to your care. Your pledge team has asked you to participate in the bold step into our future this year by increasing your pledge. Because of the very normal loss of pledge income during the senior minister transition that started five years ago when Drew retired, we currently have a $107,000 gap between our operating income and our operating expenses. Now, blessedly, as you probably remember, we received an incredibly generous bequest from our beloved Lou Krug two years ago, and that's helping us bridge the gap right now, but it's not enough to cover that gap year after year. So our pledge team is inviting us to boldly close the gap this year in order that we can fulfill our mission and continue our programs and serve our members. In a congregation this size, staff runs our programs and serves our people, which is necessary with 750 members so that we don't burn you all out as lay leaders. Your pledge goes to fund our programs, our, our whole lives program that Nick talked about, our pastoral care program that Mark talked about, our music program demonstrated by our gorgeous and amazing choir this morning, and our worship services, which we hold every Sunday, 52 weeks a year, for all of our members and friends and guests and visitors. All of these programs require staff to run them, and that requires a pledge-sustained operating budget. So Fred Gutierrez has done the math on this, and I trust him. And he tells me that if every pledging member increased their pledge by $22 a month, we will close the gap this year. $22 a month. I can do $22, I decided. It's the price of a few lattes or one takeout dinner or half the price of getting my nails done. <laughs> So I'm going to do $22 a month. I'm going to increase my pledge by that much. But I also know that not everyone will be able to increase their pledge by $22 a month. So I decided that I'm also going to pay for someone else's $22 a month. I'll get one less takeout meal delivered. This community means a lot to me. And so I am going to do my part and pay for someone else to, cl to close the gap. And I hope that you'll join me in committing to be one of the pledge units that closes the gap this year. And if you can, maybe throw in another $22 for someone else, or maybe a couple of someone else's, for someone who is not going to be able to participate in closing the gap this year. And also, since the weather has decided to give us an extra community challenge this morning, I want to ask you for one more thing. Will you have a conversation with someone who was not here this morning about the pledge drive? I'd like to ask you to commit to having one conversation with someone who wasn't here because we are all the stewards of this community, in addition to answering Elizabeth's phone call if she calls you. We create a community of trust together through both giving and receiving. We give financially, and we give our presence to our people when we show up. We give our expertise as lay leaders, and we give our time to help run the programs of this church. And we receive. We receive the strength and the support of community, the steadiness of worship every week, the inspiration of the music, and the transformation of our people's stories. We receive a community of care and the courage that comes from real and deep relationships of trust. At the end of the lunch, during which the Tree of Life synagogue members planned that action, 
one of the leaders of the congregation said, I am so glad to be having lunch with you today. I was supposed to have lunch with my beloved friend who was murdered. And if I'm going to be anywhere today eating lunch, I am grateful that it is here with you planning this. I am grateful to be here with you all. You make me stronger. You give me the courage to do what needs to be done. You raise my spirits. Thank you for being part of stewarding this community of trust. Amen.